For more than a century, UCSF has pushed the boundaries of bioscience research, education, and healthcare. We have expanded humanity's knowledge of health through award-winning research, developed treatments that have improved countless lives, trained generations of scientists, health leaders, and providers, and repeatedly set new standards in the delivery of care. Since our founding, this relentless pursuit of innovation has followed the multiplying and overlapping paths of human need and our own curiosity. I'm pleased to welcome you to this year's State of the University Address from the new UCSF Nancy Friend Pritzker Psychiatry Building on our Mission Bay campus, a facility that epitomizes our innovative spirit. Through the support and guidance of John Pritzker and Lisa Stone Pritzker, we have brought together UCSF's trailblazing work in psychiatry, neurosurgery, neurology, radiology, pediatrics, and more in one location. The work of our brilliant faculty and learners in this building will transform mental health care at the crossroads of these interrelated disciplines and shine a light that will help reduce the stigma still associated with mental illness. In fact, the very architecture of this beautiful new building was designed to embody this ambition by filling its airy spaces with natural light and art. Our expanding focus on mental health comes at a time where communities here and around the world continue to struggle under the weight of a pandemic now in its third year. We have endured multiple cycles of hope, optimism, and loss. We have been tested time and again, and somehow our work has remained as vibrant as it is critical, perhaps because of the unprecedented scale of the challenges that we have faced together. As your Chancellor, it has been humbling and gratifying to support your leadership across all of our mission areas. This past year, I have been reflecting on the question of what brings so many different people together to collaborate and drive UCSF's public mission forward, especially in the face of adversity. In attempting an answer, I am reminded of something that Cesar Chavez, the celebrated labor leader and civil rights activist once said, the end of all knowledge should be service to others. The title of my address this year is Science Plus Service. It is a reflection on what occurs at UCSF when you add those two things together. It is a review of the past year in which we saw once again the excellence of our community's foundational work in the health sciences. It is also a celebration of the work we do individually and collectively to serve the needs of those who seek us out and depend on us without favor or exception. As we evaluate our progress with an eye towards the opportunities and challenges before us, it is important that we continue to assess our work against the goals we set for ourselves in 2019. These goals, which were established prior to the pandemic, still help us focus our efforts to innovate, forge partnerships, secure our finances, and strengthen our support for our people. Extending UCSF's legacy of innovation, our researchers continue to focus on gaining fundamental insights into biology, sharing knowledge widely, and translating evidence-based discoveries into groundbreaking care. Curiosity has driven generations of UCSF scientists engage in fundamental discovery, one of our greatest strengths. Last year, we recognized the work of UCSF Nobel laureate David Julius and his team. Their work reflects the best of basic science at UCSF. His co-discovery of key mechanisms of how people sense heat, cold, and touch 
holds promise for developing new therapeutics to relieve pain and other disorders. David describes his curiosity-based research to understand the basic underpinnings of human physiology like this. Whatever you discover in biology can be relevant to real translational problems. So that's the best of both worlds. You can follow this curiosity-based route, but you know at the end of the road, it will be relevant to human health. For his work, David was recently honored with the university's most prestigious award, the UCSF Medal. Molecular biologist Natalia Dura is also drawing praise for advancing scientific knowledge through fundamental research. Natalia was honored as the 27th recipient of the annual Byers Award for Basic Science. She and her team are working to understand the molecular process that leads to breast cancer. They used cryo-electron microscopy, essentially freezing the molecules, HER2 and HER3, and then flashing them with electron beams in molecular photography to reveal the secrets of how a mutation in the HER2 molecule results in many breast cancers. Their efforts center on improving the efficacy and safety of the drug Herceptin to treat breast cancer without damaging healthy cardiac cells, a limiting side effect of the current therapy. The ability to bridge laboratory discoveries through to clinical research and ultimately to patient care solidifies the recognition of UCSF as one of the world's top academic medical centers. Let me share a few examples of how our scientists and clinicians are redefining possible. Gene therapy has for years offered hope for many people facing diseases for which a cure remains elusive. Researchers at UCSF are now using gene therapy to treat children born with a rare and deadly condition known as Artemis skid. Even with a bone marrow transplant, the current standard treatment, children with this severe form of immunodeficiency often fail to develop a normal immune system and they require repeated infusions to stay alive and healthy. UCSF pediatricians Mort Cohen and Jennifer Puck are leading a clinical trial that involves transferring a normal copy of the mutated gene into a patient's own stem cells. The US Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, fast-tracked this study to determine whether the procedure is both safe and feasible, and whether it results in a healthy immune system up to 15 years later. Let's now look at how this study may benefit one young patient who was treated here last June. Our journey was bittersweet. My grandson, H.T., was born with Artemis skid, meaning he had no immune system. And I've seen him going through a lot of pain. But after H.T. went through the Artemis clinical trial, he's living a normal life now. He's paving the road for the newborns with skid. The very first patient that I saw when I was an intern at UCSF was a child from the Navajo Nation with severe combined immunodeficiency disease. And I think that very first experience has had a tremendous impact on me. I'm Dr. Mort Cowan, and I'm the principal investigator of this clinical trial for patients with primary immune deficiencies. Mort Cowan and I have had a lifelong desire to help advance treatments for people with immune deficiencies and to bring the best care to every corner of the globe. Artemis deficient skid is considered to be the most serious of all primary immune deficiencies. Artemis has only about 50% survival, and that's what led 
Mort Cowan and me to think hard about better ways to treat skid. And we were able to do this with gene addition therapy. Skid in general is the absence of a certain part of the immune system. And when you don't have those cells, then you're very susceptible to a whole variety of infections. Their infections just accumulate and become more severe until they actually can't survive. This disease, it's common on the Navajo Reservation. And after HT was born, my daughter in law Angela called us saying that they need to take HT back to the hospital. There's something wrong with HT, that he needs to be isolated right away. We got a call from the doctors in Tuba City that there was a patient, a baby that had Artemis deficiency. And we offered the possibility that we could use gene therapy rather than a bone marrow transplant. A different kind of treatment where we would actually make the patient's own cells corrected. And that way they wouldn't be rejected. Dr. Puck and I set up a conference call with them and presented what we could about this trial. And that why we thought it would be better than a standard bone marrow transplant. So we sat down, we talked about it, and we agreed that, you know, we'll, we'll go with the UCSF. They agreed to be pioneers in this study. They really have led the way. They were willing to enroll him as the very first human ever to receive this treatment. HT is really a pioneer. We knew what we hoped would be the outcome, but it, it doesn't happen immediately. I arrived June 1st, and I didn't leave his room until October. And I pray until it was done. And after we took the first blood sample to see if there was any evidence of gene-corrected cells, and lo and behold, we saw them. It was all very exciting because he was the first patient and these were the first gene-corrected cells. We've been extremely gratified to see their immune systems have improved and not just improved, but actually become normalized in many of the cases. They're all at home, they're all healthy, and you can go to school and you play in the dirt and not have to worry. HT is so fortunate to go through the gene therapy. He's not sick anymore. He discarded all of his medication. He's happy and he's growing to be a young man. We're pioneering gene therapy in this very rare disease right now, but we are using techniques that can be exported to other situations and can help many other conditions worldwide. That's to me, what UCSF is all about. Doing the best research, but not stopping there and opening the doors of the lab and bring it to all community. And every new innovation happens one patient at a time. Launched in the 1960s, our transplant program was among the very first in the country successfully treating a variety of diseases affecting the kidneys, liver, heart, lungs, and pancreas. UCSF Health's organ transplant program, one of the largest and most highly regarded in the world, recently marked its 20,000th transplant, a national record surpassed only by UCLA. With advances in surgical techniques and improved drug regimens to prevent organ rejection and infection, Survival rates for our patients are among the highest in the country, an impressive achievement given that we treat some of the most seriously ill patients. That was the case with one of our patients, Patrick, who was looking forward to celebrating his 30th wedding anniversary with his wife, Alison. They were planning to go to Ireland, but had to cancel the trip due to the pandemic. Just as they were about to reschedule their trip, they learned that the severe fatigue Patrick was experiencing was in fact a symptom of a rare and deadly lung disease. He was transferred from his local hospital to UCSF, 
where he became the recipient of healthy transplanted lungs, becoming the 1,000th lung transplant patient at UCSF. We're so glad to hear that Patrick is doing well. He is back at work, planning that trip to Ireland and grateful for the quality of care he received at UCSF. Dating back to the 1970s, UCSF has a proud history of making many breakthrough discoveries in the field of diabetes. It was here that biochemist Bill Rudder isolated the gene for insulin, leading to the mass production of genetically engineered insulin to treat diabetes. This is considered one of the first major breakthroughs of recombinant DNA, a game changer resulting in numerous applications from vaccines to pharmaceutical products and diagnostic testing. Today, the UCSF Diabetes Center, founded by the pioneering scientist Jeff Bluestone and now led by immunologist Mark Anderson, is advancing the care and treatment of patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes with the ultimate aim of curing the disease. Mark is leading a cross-disciplinary team of biologists, immunologists, and bioengineers working to overcome significant barriers to treat type 1 diabetes, which affects some 1.6 million people in the US alone. This work also utilizes the platforms of the UCSF Baker ImmunoX, an innovative research program that harnesses the power of collaborative, cutting edge research and data sharing to catalyze discoveries about the central role of the immune system in human health. Founded by immunologist Max Crummel and others, ImmunoX is envisaged as one of the primary programs for our revitalized Parnassus Heights campus. Teams will share resources and tackle blue sky projects that build upon the strengths of UCSF's immunology program, one of the very best in the world. Today, as we embark on the transformation of our historic Parnassus Heights campus, the future we envisage is bright. We are laying the groundwork for a reinvigorated campus where those who are engaged in our mission areas of research, education, and patient care have the facilities and tools to achieve new levels of success. As our plans take shape, they are igniting a renewed sense of energy and enthusiasm for what's possible in the health sciences and education. This past year, I'm pleased to report that we achieved two significant milestones in our vision to reimagine our oldest campus on Parnassus Heights. In May, the UC Regents approved our plans to build a state-of-the-art hospital, UCSF Helen Diller Medical Center at Parnassus Heights. That hospital is set to open in 2030. Designed by acclaimed architects and designers, Herzog and de Murren, in partnership with the architect of record, HDR, this new 15-story hospital will be built to address the medical, social, psychologic, spiritual, and behavioral components of health to offer a truly holistic healing experience. The iconic human-centered design will create a healing habitat that integrates with the surrounding natural environment promoting physical and emotional health for our patients, our visitors, our faculty, our staff, and our learners. And in September, we received regential approval to move forward with our new research and academic building that will create an environment that fosters collaboration across multiple diverse UCSF communities and facilities. When it opens in 2026, this building will be a new hub for ImmunoX, as well as programs in diabetes, cell biology, microbiology, and microbiome medicine. We selected two renowned firms, HGA and Sonetta, to design this new facility, which will enhance the West End of campus. Now, it will also house the UCSF School of Nursing and feature expanded publicly accessible spaces, including a landscaped promenade and a pathway from Golden Gate Park to Mount Sutro. As we develop our Parnassus Heights campus, we are committed 
to making investments in our community. These have been summarized in a memorandum of understanding with the city and county of San Francisco in the first annual report that was released this year. We are making ongoing investments into our shared priorities to create jobs, train the workforce, enhance transportation, and build housing. These efforts align with our work to leverage UCSF's economic and intellectual power through the Anchor Institution Initiative, led by Francesca Vega, Vice Chancellor of Community and Government Relations. Now, before I talk about our collaboration with the community at large, I want to share some exciting news about a partnership right here on campus. Culminating two years of work by UCSF Health and the UCSF School of Dentistry, we are proceeding with an initiative to integrate oral health into the health system. As you know, oral health has a direct impact on overall health. The integration will bring together greater health benefits for our patients through a more holistic approach to care. Underneath this initiative, we will build dental faculty practices under the UCSF Health brand and integrate patient data through the Apex Health Record System, which goes live on December the 5th for the School of Dentistry. We have selected a site for the first dental clinic at China Basin to provide all subspecialists in one location near the UCSF Health's primary care practice. Partnering with our surrounding communities has always been a part of how UCSF fulfills its public mission, marshalling the ideas, energy, and resources across multiple sectors. The key to our coordinated public health response is forging new partnerships and fostering existing ones across public health agencies, health and education institutions, and community-based groups with elected leaders, patients, and supporters all in the mix. These partnerships are critical to serving community health needs and improving the quality of lives for people in the San Francisco Bay Area and far beyond. Of course, one of our very first partnerships with the San Francisco Unified School District is the Science and Health Education Partnership, or SEP. Launched in 1987, by UCSF biochemist Bruce Alberts, past president of the National Academy of Sciences and a US science envoy, this program focuses on getting school children interested in the life sciences. It has evolved to include the popular Bay Area Science Festival, exposing both youth and families to the wonders of science. Today, our relationship with the school district is further expanding under the leadership of Don Woodson, Director of the Center for Science Education and Outreach. Don is working with school district colleagues to create the Link Learning Hub in a new school being built on land we have transferred to the school district. This program will offer new opportunities for youth to get engaged in health, in biotechnology, and the life sciences near our Mission Bay campus. An example of an early idea is the teaching of a course on food science to shed insights on food as medicine. Another recently formed educational partnership is the San Joaquin Valley Prime Plus, an eight-year baccalaureate to MD program designed to expand high-quality medical education and healthcare delivery in the San Joaquin Valley. Led jointly by UC Merced, UCSF Fresno, and the UCSF School of Medicine. This program is an expansion of SJV Prime, which provides medical education and a focused curriculum for students who are committed to serving the communities of the San Joaquin Valley. San Joaquin Valley Prime Plus will begin accepting applicants this fall. Now let's hear from some current SJV Prime students about what being part of this program and serving the San Joaquin Valley means to them. I want to be a part of aspiring physicians that want to change and bring better health care to the San Joaquin Valley. 
the Central Valley is pretty expansive, pretty much from the south of Sacramento all the way, kind of close to LA. There's a lot of great people and it's honestly a great community. We're very diverse. There's over 150 different languages spoken in this region that we call home. Growing up in the Valley, I really didn't know about the incredible lack of access to care that people here face. But when I started applying to medical school and learned about the desperate need, I felt that it was my responsibility to come back, serve my community. There's several challenges that the Central Valley faces. In the state of California, we have the lowest rate of physicians per 100,000 people who actually need care. And that's the entire reason that the SGB Prime program exists. As a medical student, I've experienced that firsthand um, in the primary care clinic that I worked in. We would refer patients to specialists and their visits would be scheduled for nearly a year in advance. By the time that you're being referred to a specialist, you have exceeded the capabilities of your primary care doctor and you need care soon, but our patients simply aren't able to get it and they really do deserve better than that. It just doesn't end there. Once these patients are coming into clinics and being seen, a lot of them have been waiting for many, many years just to seek care because they're undocumented or uninsured. This program provides you with an opportunity to learn from experts, really, both in medicine and in social issues that impact the Valley. I already knew that I wanted to serve the community. I had early exposure to some of the health disparities that exist in the Valley. I remember my dad telling me growing up, just don't get sick just because you know, we don't know who to go to or we don't have insurance or enough money to cover for it. UCSF is very special to me. My mom was actually diagnosed with ovarian cancer when I was 15 and I joined her on that journey as she fought for her life. I saw the physicians treating her were treating her with a lot of compassion and they were super committed to try to get her to be better or just feel better in that moment. As a kid watching that happen, I knew instantly I wanted to be one of them. A program like SJB Prime is really unique in the sense that by the time that you're a practicing physician, you will have had at least two years to really get to know the community and understand the challenges and barriers to accessing high quality health care that our patients face. I'm a firm believer of being raised in the Valley and being trained in the Valley. You are being prepared to be a physician for the Valley. You are of the community and you're going to always stand for those values that meant something to you while you were growing up. I want to be a doctor that's respectful, compassionate. I want everyone to walk in through those doors knowing that they're going to be treated equally. And that's something that the SJB Prime program has really helped embed in us during our training. I know just a few years ago, the thought about training medical students from a program such as UCSF was just a dream. And it's happening. We're here, we're being trained in our community, and we're doing it for our community members. I think what people are really going to remember is the way they're treated, the way they're spoken to, and the way that they're advocated for, especially here in the Valley when some patients may not know how to advocate for themselves. I still remember my parents, you know, I asked them, like, why, why are we going to America? Pretty much what they said was, there's a lot more opportunities here. Obviously, I didn't know what it meant back then. Eventually, I figured out that's medicine for me. And so I think having a medical school here in the Valley, we're kind of reaching out and making sure that the talented students that we have here in the Valley are given those opportunities to become physicians. And so you're kind of helping them reach their potential, but it also helps the Central Valley because we need more physicians. And I think it's a win-win for pretty much everyone. Of course, our longest partnership is our affiliation with Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, which celebrates 150 years of serving our community this year. We are proud to be their partner in public health, serving the city through every crisis, from the 1906 earthquake and fire, to HIV, AIDS in the 80s, and now COVID-19, and in every year in between. Three years into this pandemic, we are turning the corner, thanks to our researchers, physicians, nurses, and other clinicians and staff who have been working on the front lines of both science and service. Recently, UCSF, the San Francisco Department of Public Health and San Mateo County Health began working with local community groups to better understand long COVID, the condition in which symptoms persist long after the initial infection. 
Co-led by epidemiologist Kim Rhodes and infectious disease specialist Karina Marquez, both leaders in health equity, this program works with Black and Latino communities that are most affected by long COVID to learn what causes it, how to prevent it, and how to treat it. Another partnership focuses on conducting early stage research to identify and validate new viral targets to treat COVID-19 and other viruses with pandemic potential. Supported by the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases with an initial $67.5 million award, representing the single largest award in UCSF's history. This effort establishes one of nine multidisciplinary academic industry research centers in the country. Directed by molecular and systems biologist Nevin Krogan, the Quantitative Biosciences Institute Coronavirus Research Group comprises 43 investigators from 14 institutions in the United States and around the world. The significant investment in this initiative is a tremendous validation of the many outstanding scientists engaged in this work. Just last month, the French government awarded Nevin the Legion of Honor, the highest French award for service. He has been collaborating with the Institute Pasteur and elsewhere to find a treatment for COVID-19 as the pandemic spread around the globe. That partnership has led to plans for a new collaboration between QBI and Institute Pasteur focused on emerging infectious diseases, bringing together the strength of the Pasteur's global health network and our expertise in technology and discovery. Today, the state of our university is strong with total revenues reaching $9.4 billion in fiscal year 22. In the last fiscal year, we experienced sustained growth in our patient care and research activities. The state support has been steady and philanthropic giving remains as robust as ever. Our 10-year financial plan projects a solid financial future. We do, however, continue to face a number of macroeconomic challenges. These include the inflationary pressures that are driving up our costs, investment performance of our endowment has weakened, and the cost of borrowing is climbing. Meanwhile, the national economic forecast remains unpredictable and precarious. To achieve our long-term goals, we need to be efficient, spend our public funds responsibly, and identify savings that can be redirected to support our strategic priorities investing in our people, our facilities, and our programs. We also need to maintain a strong financial position within UCSF Health in order to secure the debt financing that will enable us to build the new facilities at Panassas Heights and at Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland. Of course, our financial health is due in no small part to the confidence that funders, and supporters have in our dedicated scientists, clinicians, staff, trainees, and learners. They all work together to make the world a better place. We continue to garner incredible donor support of our mission-driven work, allowing us to explore new frontiers in science and to build for the future. We are grateful to an anonymous donor who pledged a groundbreaking $25 million commitment to UCSF, together with a $25 million pledge to UC Berkeley that has enabled the launch of the Computational Precision Health Program, a partnership between our two great campuses. Led by co-directors Ida Sim, a UCSF professor of medicine, and Maya Peterson, professor of biostatistics and epidemiology at UC Berkeley, this program combines high-performance computing and advanced data science to improve the quality and equity of healthcare. It is a joint PhD program between our two UC campuses to train the next generation of researchers, to design, build, and test innovations such as machine learning, digital health, and clinical decision support systems within 
the clinical record. UCSF continues to excel in the highly competitive quest for government-sponsored research. Laboratory research and clinical trials are back to full strength and our faculty continue to attract new grants and contracts. For the 15th year in a row, UCSF ranks highly among all public and private institutions nationwide and is fourth overall for funding from the National Institutes of Health. In fact, UCSF set a record for NIH funding to a public university, being awarded nearly 1,500 grants and contracts, totaling more than $709 million. This represents a $23 million increase from 2020. Our schools of dentistry, nursing, and pharmacy ranked first amongst their peer institutions in NIH funding. The School of Medicine ranked second overall and was the first amongst public schools in the field. Now, while the world is divided by war, politics, religion, culture, and the distrust of science, the people of UCSF have remained resilient, standing unified and drawing strength from one another. From the past to the present, we have rallied together as a community with courage and compassion, moving our society forward, often in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. Ours is a history of individuals who have taken the initiative to fight for equal opportunity, equity, and inclusion. It was here in May 1968, just a month after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., when black men and women formed the University of California's first affinity group known as the Black Caucus. Together, they organized and fought for equal rights and advancement, calling attention to the blatant racism and discrimination at UCSF at the time. Their courage and conviction led the way for better recruitment and treatment of employees of color and a greater enrollment of historically excluded learners. We honored three of the many Black Caucus pioneers for their public service with this year's UCSF Medal, the university's highest honor for pushing the university and our nation forward. Today, more than 50 years later, a new generation of Black Caucus members are committed to upholding the legacy of those who came before them, knowing their work is not done. We also saluted Jenny Chin Hansen, an alumna of the UCSF School of Nursing with the UCSF Medal for her public service as a national leader in healthcare for seniors. Jenny led a pioneering program in San Francisco that made it possible for seniors to live independently, receiving comprehensive medical and social services at home rather than in a nursing home. This program has since been replicated nationwide. Over the past year, we also have seen faculty, staff, and learners champion diversity, equity, and inclusion in the LGBTQIA community. Let's take a few minutes now to learn more about these efforts. Since the AIDS epidemic, UCSF has been a really important institution that's been at the forefront of LGBTQ health. And while that may be true compared to other health institutions in other cities and across the world, there still is work that needs to be done. So my name is Jay Bindman. My pronouns are they, them. I am a fourth year medical student at UCSF, currently on a research year. I'm particularly focused on the language that we use around gender. For example, pronouns, having a distinction between gender identity, gender expression, sex assignment at birth, basically trying to get to the bottom of why are we misgendering patients and in what contexts and what sort of interventions or trainings will allow us to actually affirm patients when they come to us for care. There were times that there were gaps that I was noticing in the curriculum. When I saw that we had LGBT health lessons that didn't talk anything about the value of correctly gendering or correctly making space for your patient's lived experience. And so we scheduled a meeting with faculty advisors and we, we offered our feedback and basically said, we appreciate that there are lessons on LGBTQ health, but we think that something's missing and we would like to see change in the following ways. And that moment I think was a real wake up call for administrators. Like, oh, this isn't some fringe issue. This is central to why a lot of students are here and wanting to get training and we need to make a change. And so, 
This realignment of values that's come together in the last couple years in which I see students, faculty, deans, administrators all on the same page that UCSF is working toward a shared vision for LGBT inclusive curriculum. That's been tremendously rewarding, really creating real guidelines for teaching that make it so it's not just pockets of education that are much improved, but it's the entire UCSF medical education experience. When the pandemic started, the community that I was primarily working with were trans Latinx folks and immediately everyone lost their income. People were very panicked and knowing that my communities were being so deeply impacted really pushed me to want to be a part of the COVID work. So I'm Luis gutierrez Mock. my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm currently a pandemic response specialist supervisor with the UCSF Pandemic Initiative for Equity and Action here at UCSF. Pretty immediately with COVID, UCSF recognized that there was going to be an, a huge need for contact tracing and case investigation. And so I came in and I helped to facilitate some of those trainings. I saw what was happening with the data collection and how my communities were being excluded. And at the very beginning, there was little research and little data that showed LGBT populations experience for COVID-19. And it started to be more and more clear that it was necessary for us to collect this information. Because without an idea of how many transgender, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people in California are impacted by COVID, we wouldn't know if the disparities are there or not. And so I've been able to shift the response options and the questions in the statewide database for case investigation and contact tracing. And this is the basis for what the state is planning to use moving forward for infectious diseases. And so I feel like the impact is now beyond COVID and it's going to be useful for any future infectious diseases that we encounter. I personally take my responsibility as an out LGBTQ faculty member very seriously. I had very few of those role models going through my training. And so for me, providing that example of someone who has had the privilege and the safety to be able to be out and be open, not only to help patients, but then also to help my colleagues and folks who are coming behind me. My name is Nicole Rosendale. I'm an assistant professor of neurology in the Neurohospitalist Division at UCSF in San Francisco General Hospital. and the co-director of a new initiative within neurology called Balance, focused on global health and health equity. Social justice work really hasn't traditionally been integrated into this field, but I have had the distinct privilege of being able to build a platform both within UCSF and nationally really helping people to understand why LGBTQ health is important within neurology. It's a community that often is invisible within the healthcare system and yet experiences high proportions of discrimination. And so I think really understanding what are the drivers of these disparities for the community, and then as a clinician, really being able to take care of people who are in quite a vulnerable point in their life. And in doing that, I'm also teaching. And so I'm helping to guide medical students and residents in their path towards becoming really empathic clinicians. And it's so exciting to be able to talk with them and to see how I can help them navigate that path to be able to make it a more inclusive and safe space. There are many other examples of social justice and health equity efforts that connect UCSF with the communities that we serve. Let me share a few. Glide's healthcare training program called Healers at the Gate brings together campus security supervisors, nurses, social workers, and other healthcare professionals from across UCSF to meet with people impacted by racism, homelessness, and substance abuse. Our obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive science department and our National Center of Excellence in Women's Health work to ensure equitable access to reproductive and maternal health care for all people as an important fundamental human right. Through our UCSF Transgender Care Program, a multidisciplinary effort that provides evidence-based care for transgender 
and gender non-binary communities. We are conducting pioneering research and are training future providers in gender-affirming care. Within our graduate division, a unique 10-week service learning course has been launched to support our PhD students in developing in-depth knowledge of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. The School of Nursing has initiated the Climate Change Health and Social Justice course, which is open to learners from all UCSF schools to give them a better understanding of climate change's impact on health equity for patients and communities. At the School of Dentistry, we are expanding our role as a safety net provider in California and the West by growing our community externship network and expanding services to veterans and a remote Alaskan tribal organization. Students at the School of Pharmacy are leading efforts to improve equity and inclusion in the PharmD program, publishing a blueprint for pharmacy students to adopt nationwide. And our School of Medicine is building a scientific and healthcare workforce that reflects all aspects of diversity in our state. They are redesigning our ecosystem to focus on anti-oppression and foster belonging as part of the Differences Matter initiative. Our pride values are important for guiding our beliefs and behaviors, but it is the collective will and interactions of our people that results in our UCSF culture. Building and sustaining a welcoming and inclusive environment requires intentional effort from us all. As Talmadge King, Dean of the School of Medicine points out, it is not about what we proclaim, it's about what we practice and promote every day that really matters. And Renee Navarro, Vice Chancellor of Diversity and Outreach, emphasizes that we must all take responsibility for our practices, our beliefs, and our biases that maintain structural inequities. My leadership team and I are committed to cultivating an environment that supports you and your work and that enables you to grow and feel seen and heard within our UCSF community. Over this past year, it has been exciting to welcome a new wave of UCSF leadership. Nikkei Blake, Vice Provost of Student Academic Affairs and Dean of the Graduate Division. Hal Collard, Vice Chancellor of Research. Kathy Giacomini, Dean of the School of Pharmacy. Erin Gore, Senior Vice Chancellor of Finance and Administrative Services. And Suresh Gunasekaran, the new President and CEO of UCSF Health. And finally, Erin Hickey, Vice Chancellor of University Development and Alumni Relations. Together, we are making progress to continually improve our UCSF culture, but more work must be done to address the weaknesses identified through our climate, staff engagement, and physician surveys. The past few years have been challenging, and I'm grateful for the sacrifices you have made in service to our patients, our learners, and our communities. As we approach the end of a third year of the pandemic, we are taking a renewed effort to dedicate more resources to address issues of well-being and belonging. We are coordinating with the Office of Diversity and Outreach, our Learning and Organization Development Team, our Human Resources Department, and our Wellness and Community Teams, and others to develop action plans that invest in you, our people. We are offering more funding to support well-being in all its forms, expanding social justice circles to build and strengthen relationships in our community and looking at ways to reshape the future of work. Under the leadership of Chief Human Resources Officer, Corey Jackson, we are looking towards efforts that will help shift our people focus from merely attracting and retaining talent to empowering our people to maximize their potential. We envisage implementing a strategy to optimize our culture for all who work, learn and provide care and who discover at UCSF. We want to identify how we can cultivate and motivate leaders in creating the conditions in which everyone
can thrive and do their best work. It is a simple truth that the greatest strength of a world-class organization is its people. For generations, the people in our community have been leading revolutions in science and service. We have redefined, as we like to say, the limits of what is possible. As I close this year's address, I want to take just a minute to recognize an individual who personifies this dual commitment to excellence. An esteemed teacher, neurologist, and social justice warrior, Dan Lowenstein has been a member of our community since 1983. Dan is stepping down as executive vice chancellor and provost at the end of this year, as you know. But I am heartened that he will continue his teaching and research at UCSF. Dan's contributions reflect the very best of what we do when we pair our pursuit of innovation in the health sciences with compassionate service. What distinguishes our particular approach to serving others is that it has been woven into the very fabric of our public mission from the start. A mission that calls upon us to serve our patients, our communities and our learners without regard to their identity or affiliation. This may explain why we get something much more than the sum of their parts when we add science and service together at UCSF. History has shown us that the work our community pursues across all our mission areas is irrepressible, just like water over a dam. We have made incredible progress against our key four goals this past year. Extraordinary achievements made all the more remarkable considering the challenges we have faced together. As we look forward to 2023, we must keep a focus on these goals, which provide a roadmap to our future, regardless of what comes our way. Thank you for your many contributions and your ingenuity in overcoming the hurdles we have encountered. Most of all, thank you for your leadership and commitment to serving others through what we have always done, driving innovation across research, education, and clinical care. It is early November, and the holidays are just around the corner. I wish for you, your family, and friends the opportunity to enjoy each other's company as we look forward to a bright new year.